Man, it is so good to see everyone. And again, where, where you're joining us from, whether it's online, another campus, we just wanna welcome you again. Uh, hey, we're in this series called First Comes Love, and we're, we're talking about relationships. And uh, I don't know if you remember this. It, it, you know, when I was a kid, if you, if you liked somebody, other kids would sing a song. Do you remember this? All right, I mean, you, you might know it, like Harrison and Lindsay sitting in a tree. K-I-S-S-I-N-G. First comes love, then comes marriage, then comes a baby in the baby carriage. Some of you didn't know the other songs we were singing, but you're like, oh, I got that one. I know that one, (laughs) right? Now, as I've gotten older, you know, I I think I've realized that relationships are are way more complicated than that song seems to imply, right? But here's, I do think they did get something right. First comes love. If, if we get love right, if we figure out how to do this whole love thing well, man, it serves as a foundation for all of our relationships. And the problem is, though, that so many of us have the wrong idea of what love is or what it looks like or what it requires of us. So that's why we're doing this series. You know, uh, Over the next few weeks, uh, we're going to ask a lot of us to unlearn some ideas about love and relationships that many of us have, because what we wanna do is we want to restore a biblical understanding of what love looks like, because again, listen, when it comes to any of our relationships, first comes love, everything's built off of that. And so we wanna define that for you in this way. So go ahead and turn in your Bible to Philippians chapter two. Hopefully you brought it with you. Uh, We're gonna camp out there just so you know. Philippians chapter two is a phenomenal passage. If if the New Testament were like a mountain peak, this would be one of the peaks that you wanna look at and you wanna know well. And so I wanna invite you, go ahead and open up your Bible. If you didn't bring one with you, there's there's one on the chair near you or um, we'll just put them up on the screen. But as a church family, we're a people of the word. Okay, so everything that we do, everything that we try to understand is rooted in the word. And so I wanna encourage you, bring your Bible, study this, take on a posture of a student right now as we walk through this. Uh, But you remember last week, Pastor Cam talked about this idea of, of four loves. In the Greek, there are four words to describe different kinds of love. And it helps us get a more broad understanding of what these things are. If you remember, there was phileo, this is the, the friendship love. This is the, hey, I like you. You know, this is the, hey, we're, we're, we're close together. Then there's eros. Um, this is where we get the word erotic. This is the romantic love. This is the fiery kind of love. This is the fun love, but it doesn't last long, and you can't build a relationship on it, which is why we're going to have to talk about that one a little bit more later in the series. Uh, but there's storge. Storge is a familial love. This is the love that's like, I belong to you. You're in my family. You're, you know, a father and a son or daughter, a mother. And, you know, it's this familial love that creates belonging. But then there's finally agape. And and if you've been around church long, you've probably heard that word more than once. Um, But today, what I want us to understand is like, how do you understand what agape is? How do we live this out? Because agape is this God-like love. Okay, it is a willed love. It is, it is chosen. It is unconditional. It's non-reciprocal. It's covenantal. That's what kind of love this is. But let me tell you why I think it's so important for us to get this. Because it's obvious to me, and I'm sure it's obvious to many of us, that we're doing something wrong in our relationships. Aren't we? Like it, it, whether it's you've got friends who, who've kind of walked through different relational dynamics or train wrecks, or maybe your own lived experience is the one relational train wreck after another. Because for many of us, there's, there's pain tied to our relationships. I mean, for decades now, the Barna Group research has shown that born again Christians, listen to this, People who claim, hey, Jesus is my Lord and Savior, they've been baptized, they're trusting him and walking in his ways. Born again Christians have the same likelihood of divorce as non-Christians. How does that, how's that possible? When, when we read the word and it says that God is love and yet his church for some reason can't figure out how to live that out. We're, we're not getting some things, and that's what we're gonna talk about. So for many of us, how we have been doing relationships isn't working. It isn't working. So I think it's time that we try something different. Maybe there are things that you've built your whole idea about love on that's been wrong, and so maybe we need to get rid of some things. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to look at um, a, a passage today. Because when it comes to relationships, don't you wish there was like a magic pill or something? Like, hey, if you take this for two weeks, man, guess what? All your relationships are going to be awesome. Right? Don't we want that? Yeah, don't we want, like, tell me the secret, okay? Tell me, like, what's the one thing that if I did this, it would just fix my relationships? Well, there is good news. Now, I do feel like, like a little bit like a salesman, like, hey, good news for you. Um, there is a secret to relationships. Paul's gonna give us the, the secret in this passage. And honestly, if, if you actually believe this, and if you lived this way, you would find out that the secret is true. It would fix your relationships, it would solve the relational problems that you're walking with right now. So again, uh, look at Philippians chapter two. We're gonna start in verse one. We're just gonna walk through this together. So we're gonna put it on the screen if you don't have the Bible with you. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness in compassion, what Paul's saying is like, church family, listen to me. If, if your walk with Jesus has meant anything to you, if by putting your trust in Jesus you've experienced any of his goodness, any of his tenderness, any of his compassion, any of his love, then he says, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same what? Love, agape, that's the word that he's using there. Have the same agape type love, being one in spirit and of one mind. So again, Paul, just in case you don't know, famous first century church planner man, he was a beast at starting churches and writing these letters to the churches. So he writes to the church in Philippi and he says, I'm giving you a secret. I wanna show you how to love well as a church family. And what I think is we could take his instructions that are designed for a church body because the church, it's an unexpected family. It's made up of different kind of folks from different kind of backgrounds, yet all united in Jesus through the spirit. And so what he's saying is, let me help this church, this unexpected family figure out how to be united in love. But if you apply this to any of your relationships, I think it's gonna help. But it's one thing to say, hey, you need to love each other. You know, I say that to my kids all the time and it doesn't seem to help. It's like, man, come on, just like, like get this, you know. And, but often what makes it worse is that you and I might have different understandings or different definitions of what it means to love one another. It's, it's kind of like saying to your friend, like, hey, don't be worried. I don't know if you've had a friend like they're going through a crazy time, super anxious about it. They got this interview coming up or this procedure they got to get prepared for. And with all the love and sincerity in your heart, you look at them and you just say, hey, don't worry about it. Do they ever say, whoa, thanks. <laughs> I, I didn't consider that was one of the options. You know what I mean? Like the, the only thing I've been feeling is anxiety about this, but I didn't know we could not be worried about it. So man, thank you. No, what's the, what's the problem? How in the world am I supposed to not worry about something like that? Right? Same thing with love. How in the world do we figure out how to love like Jesus? How in the world do we figure out how to love with this agape kind of love, to live this united in love kind of life, whether it's in the church or whether it's with our friends or as a married couple or on our teams? So here it is. He's giving you the secret. Ready? Verse three. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. So he says, hey, in your relationships, there are two things you need to watch out for, this, this idea of selfish ambition and vain conceit. He's saying, you gotta get rid of these things. You, get rid of this idea of self-preservation. Get rid of this idea that you've gotta protect what's yours, like this, it's a self-seeking, it's a selfish ambition, it's seeking your own gain or advantage at the cost of others. The, these folks are consumed by their own interests, consumed by their own needs. They feel like they have to protect it. They have to fight to protect and survive. Okay, there's a self-preservation that a lot of us bring to our relationships. He also says, hey, get rid of this idea of self-promotion. I mean, have, the, the word that Paul uses translates this vain conceit. It literally means empty glorification of the self. 
It's an empty glorifying of yourself. This is the arrogant person who will always fight to prove that they are right. Anybody know someone like that? Don't point, don't nudge. Whoa, hey, safe place, safe. Yeah, but, but this idea of self-promotion, th- these are the folks that are making much of themselves when there's not much to make much of. You know what I mean? They, they have to be, hey, give me your attention or you have to see that I'm good enough or you have to see that I'm up here. They, they're always self-promoting. They can't be wrong. They have to be right. It's like trying to maintain a, a meaningful relationship built on mutual equality with a toddler. Anybody ever tried that? Man, look, I love toddlers. Props to all of you who serve in our kids' ministry because, man, it is awesome. Toddlers are some of the funnest and funniest humans alive, okay, sometimes. Um, but, but the reality is the, the problem is that they believe you exist to serve them. That's their approach to life. You exist to provide for my needs. You exist to meet my every desire. And man, a relationship like that is just tough. It's tough. But let's make it, I mean, personal for a second. If what you bring to your relationships, and again, this is your marriage, this could be your team that you're on, this could be the dorm room, I mean, this could be your class, this could be your unit, whatever relationships are in your life, If what you bring is self-preservation and self-promotion, what is the focus of that relationship? Yourself. Yourself. And if that is the focus, it will not build a relationship of unity in love. Can't happen. St. Augustine, he's this well-known theologian, he said it this way, sin is the result of a life turned in on itself. So as opposed to living for God and living for others, another author said it this way, the essence of sin then is a disordered love. If you're married, but you put yourself above your spouse, that's out of order. That's a disordered love. If you you love yourself more than you love God or more than you love others, heads up, that's a disordered love. Love and it produces sin of all kinds. That's what he's saying here. What will ruin virtually every relationship that you intend to build is disordered love or distorted love. Those four loves we're talking about, you take those from the original design that God had and you twist them into something else, man, it just produces all kind of dysfunction and all kind of brokenness and all kind of sin. But Paul gives us, again, the secret to flourishing. Listen, it, this is a secret to flourishing in your relationships. He says, rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. What is he saying? You gotta get the order right. Value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. Paul's instruction here is simple. He says, look, choose humility. Humility. He says, choose humility. This is, has more to do with an action rather than a state of being because some of you are saying like, man, that's just not my personality. Doesn't matter. It's a choice you're making. It's not a, it's not a state of being. You're choosing to humble yourself. You're choosing to take the lower seat. You're choosing the worst cup of Pepsi if you were here last week. You're choosing to become the servant. That's what you're deciding. You're choosing. I was talking with... Jason Coster, he's a campus pastor at Bluffton, and he said when he was studying this passage, that word humility that Paul uses right here, he says it conjures up this image of someone who wraps a towel around their waist, puts a towel over their arm to serve. Do you remember when Jesus, before he was arrested, before he was tried, he had this last meal with his disciples, so to speak? Do you remember this? And so Jesus kind of rallies around the disciples and he says, hey, um, we're gonna eat this meal together. This is gonna be a really special time. But in that moment, all of the disciples were going, who's gonna wash the feet? Because in that day, the servant or the lowest in the house would do the worst job. And so 
Everybody's going like, look, I sat two seats from Jesus last week, so it's not me. I mean, look, I, I was like close enough to feel his sweat. You know what I mean? So, so, so what Jesus does is he takes a towel, wraps it around his waist, puts it over his arm, so to speak, and he just goes to his disciples. And one disciple after another, he washes their feet, dries them off, including the one that was going to betray him. Washes the feet, takes the role of the servant, he goes to one disciple after another and it just creates a sense of awe and they're all just shocked and they're just going like, why in the world would Jesus do this? Do you know what he said at the end of that? John 13, 15, Jesus said, I have set an example that you should do as I have done for you. He's saying, listen to me, if you take, if you take following me seriously, do as I do. This is the posture that I'm inviting you into. So that's what I want us to do. Let's figure this out. How do we do as Jesus did? How do we follow his lead in this? And what I wanna do is I wanna read uh, the rest of this section, but man, I have to say, this is, this is a powerful section. So I wanna invite you, let's all stand on our feet real quick. Um, even if you're watching at another campus, let's get on your feet, even online, um, join us. Uh, we're gonna stand real quick, unless it's dangerous. Like if you're driving or something, don't do it. Um, <laughs> But if you're in a safe place, stand. Um, that we're we're going to read God's word, and I want you to hear this passage different. You might know this passage really well. Listen to how special this is. We're going to get a glimpse of the example of Jesus. Listen to this. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen? Amen. It's the word of the Lord. Go ahead and have a seat. If we want to do as Jesus did, we're going to use this passage as an example of what he did in his life and how God responded. Here's the first thing I want you to see. First thing that Jesus did is, or the way he thought in really is, it's not about getting your way, it's about getting out of the way. It's not about getting your way, it's about getting out of the way. Even though Jesus, listen to this, is the very form of God, the word there is morphe, that means essence, made of the same stuff as God. What this passage is saying is Jesus is God. He's in the human flesh. But even as God, he did not demand his rights. He was secure enough in who he was not to demand his own way. Even though he was fully God, he emptied himself of his rights. And I love this because this is what helps us understand that, no, no, when you think about Jesus, he is fully God and fully man. Now try to have, wrap your mind around that mystery. It's a big one. But the way he could do that is as God himself, he limited himself. He emptied himself of his rights. Now I do want to nerd out for a section or for a moment here. Paul points out this juxtaposition, okay? He says, we have this tendency to be self-seeking and self-promotional and Jesus his example is to empty himself of his rights. Let me show you these words. <clears throat> Kenodoxia is the word that Paul uses to describe us. This empty or vain conceit. This empty glorifying of the self. It's this, we have to protect, we have to promote ourselves. We have to be higher than we really are. That's our tendency. You wanna seem better in the eyes of other people, don't you? I do. But look at Jesus' example. His example is kanao, to empty himself, to not demand his rights. You see, our tendency is to want all the glory and all the attention, and his tendency is to give it up. 
Paul helps us see, hold on, there are two pictures here. Choose this one. See, what does it look like to live, in, live your life this way? What would emptying ourselves look like um, in, in our lives? You know, sometimes I wish I had an example to share that was like a long time ago because then I could say, man, look, I've grown a lot since then. Um, but this example happened Sunday after Cam's sermon on how to love well, okay? And so um, it was my turn to take the kids to Sunday night church. And so I was like, all right, everybody load up. It's time to go. About, <clears throat> about halfway there, we realized we had forgotten our neighbor. Um, and, and I was stuck. I was stuck on 95. So what did I do? I started blaming every single person in the car. I was blaming both of my middle school kids. I was like, why didn't you tell me we had to get our name? I text my wife. I had, I voice text my wife um, in the car. I, I said, I said I, why didn't you remind me we were supposed to? And, and everybody said, we did remind you. And I was like, I don't believe that. I didn't hear any of that. Listen, I fought it. I fought it. Man, listen, sorry, Colton. Um, but, but I... I fought it, and the problem is that I was wrong. And I did not want to be wrong. I wanted it to be someone else's fault. Just like this idea of empty conceit, I had to be right even though I was wrong. I had to protect myself because, listen, I, didn't, I couldn't face the fact that I had made a mistake. I mean, for crying out loud, all the time we're saying, hey, everybody, bring your one to church, and I just forgot ours. And I'm like, man... This is, this is not good. Do you, ever, do you ever struggle with stuff like that? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, do you have to get your way instead of getting out of the way? Look, some of us bring this to our relationships. Either this idea of self-protection or self-preservation and self-promotion. And I just want to say, uh, if, if, as we're talking about this, different incidents are coming to your mind. Can I just say, you, you probably need to go seek forgiveness you need to take a courageous step. Just say you're sorry. Seek some forgiveness. Work towards reconciling some of these things, especially because these issues tend to grow if we don't address them. So I just want to say, if you've kind of broken some relationships, because I did. I hurt my relationships last Sunday. And, and we have to mend those things if we're going to move forward. But again, it's not about getting your way. It's about getting out of the way. Um, Here's the second thing. It's not about being served. It's about serving others. It's not about being served. That, listen, all of these things, Jesus' example is, falls so counter to how our culture processes things. Look again at verse seven. It says, he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men. I need you to see something. The way Paul writes this the way he's helping us understand, he's going, I need you to understand part of what it means to be a human, to be made in human form or likeness. The human form, the likeness of humanity is to become, heads up, a servant. It's part of our design that in our relationships, we would become a servant of those around us. Our relationship works best when we serve each other, when we take this posture to all our relationships, your work, your, your marriage, just kind of show up and you put the, arm, the towel around your arm and you say, all right, I'm here to serve. Let me kind of give, um, let me give you some scenarios and you decide, am I gonna be a servant or what would I normally do? Here's the first scenario. Um, say you come home after a long day of work and uh, your roommate has left a sink full of dishes. What do you do? It's easy, get a new roommate. <laughs> that person's the worst. No, I'm just kidding, <laughs> I'm just kidding, you wouldn't do that. Um, you, would, you would, no, you'd go, okay, you, uh, what does it mean to serve them? You'd go, chances are they had a pretty rough day too. Chances are they had to fight some battles that I don't know about yet. So the way I'm gonna serve is do the dishes for them and then start looking for a new roommate. So, no, I'm just kidding, <laughs> I'm just kidding about it. Okay, say you're married. Um, and your, your baby starts crying in the middle of the night. Do you get up and tend to your crying child so that your wife, who's literally been taking care of this human the whole day, um, so that she can rest, or do you pretend to be asleep and let her get up instead? Purely hypothetical question. 
just to point out. So the way we would do it is Lindsay would get up and then I'd get up right then and be like, oh, I was gonna do that. Oh man, okay. Um, <clears throat> Cause I was broken. I'm a broken human. Okay. Um, no, 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 you would, you would put the towel around your arm and you'd get up. What does it look like to serve in that moment? You'd get up, all right? Here's the last one. You say you pull into the church parking lot and there's a spot right up front, okay? You see it, but this other person sees it. What do you do? <laughs> listen, listen, if you've been coming to this church for more than a year, you park far away and you sit up close, okay? That's how you serve. You give up your spot in the lot so that more people who don't know Jesus can get a close spot in the lot. But listen, this is such a helpful filter when it comes to our relationships. If you literally just asked, next time you encounter your spouse or your kids or your roommate, if you just simply had this filter in your mind of, what does it look like to serve them? How can I serve? Man, it just changes things. There's a, there's a secret to choosing humility, doing this the way that Jesus did it. And so it's not about getting your way, it's about getting out of the way. It's not about serve, being served, it's about serving others. And here's the last thing I wanna point out. It's not about taking control, but it's about trusting God. It's not about taking control, this is about trusting God. This is, this is what it looks like to, to walk in humble obedience. Your part is humble obedience. And then you trust God with the rest. Humble obedience and you trust God with the rest. Look at verse eight. In being found in human form, Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Now, look at what the Father, look at how the Father responds to his son's obedience. Jesus humbled himself. The author of life itself humbled himself to become, to, to death, even death on a cross. He was not self-seeking. He was self-sacrificial. He was self-giving in his love. And look at what the father does when he sees his son's humble obedience. Verse nine, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that's above every other name. Jesus humbled himself, and then God exalted him for it. He lifted him up. He promoted him, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, just before we move too far from this. This passage overwhelmingly clarifies something. Jesus is Lord. Now, I don't know where all of us are in our journey. Um, my hope is that every week you come, you get to know Jesus a little bit better. But let me just say this. Jesus isn't Lord because you believe it or not. Nobody makes Jesus Lord. He is Lord. You either submit to that or you resist it. But he is Lord of heaven and earth. He is the one who is in charge. He lived a life that proved he is the one worthy king. He lived a life to prove he is the Lord over all creation. He died a death on our behalf, but when he, ra he was raised from the dead, he proved Jesus himself is God and Lord and Savior. There is no other. There is no other. And here's what I want to say. For some of us, we've been following him for decades, and we want to become just like him because he showed us his way is better. But some of us in this room, we've stiff-armed him, we've resisted him, or we've just simply ignored him. Here's what this passage says, and please just listen to me. This passage at least helps us know he is due the respect to at least see if this is true or not. He is worth at least you looking into this. So if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, I wanna say, man, you gotta at least consider this because what he's saying is there's coming a day when every tongue will look at him and go, oh my goodness, it's Jesus. Jesus is Lord and I'm not. Jesus is Lord and there is no other. So you have to consider him. 
You have to take him serious. But there's another dynamic that plays out here, which I think we can kind of hold on to for ourselves. Look at what happens. When, when you stop fighting for yourself, when you stop promoting yourself, and instead you choose humility like Jesus did, when you choose to serve others before yourself, when you choose to be obedient to God's way instead of your way, God then fights for you. When you humble yourself, he lifts you up. When you stop fighting for you, he fights for you. When you stop protecting you, he protects you. Listen, so many of us walk into our relationships and we're trying to fight for something, we're trying to provide, we're trying to force things, and God's going, okay, let's see how you do on your own. But the moment we humble ourselves, the moment we say, God, I trust you, my responsibility, humble obedience, your responsibility, everything else, as soon as you start to trust him, you finally figure out that he is the kind of God that has your back. He's going to show up for you. He's going to provide for you. Listen, this is a better way of relating. This is a better way of living. Stop settling for something else. Stop settling for something that's not gonna work. It hasn't, has it? Try something new. Try something different. I mean, can you imagine? <laughs> Just do me a favor, in your, in your own mind, think of one of your you know, most significant relationships. In your mind, can you imagine what that relationship would look like if you did this? Where one person considered the interest of the other person above their own, and then that person considered the interest of the other above their own. Think of what that relationship would feel like. Think of what that would look like. You know, for some of us, we're sitting here and we're going like, and we're literally thinking like, listen, what if I decide to be a servant but they don't serve me back? Some of us are going like, I don't know if I wanna do that. Well, heads up, that's not agape love. That's something else. That's either a disordered love or a distorted love. The kind of contractual, like, well, if you do this, I'll do this stuff. That's not agape. Agape is non-reciprocal. You know what that means? It means I'm going to walk this way even if you don't in return. I'm going to give you love. I'm going to give you respect. I'm going to serve you. I'm going to get out of the way even if you don't. That's what agape looks like. But man, think about when two people do this. This is, this is what love, real love chooses humility. Think of how this plays out. Like, first off, no one would ever make it inside because one person's holding the door and they're like, no, you first. And then the other person's like, no, you first, right? It'd be obnoxious. <laughs> I'm just kidding, that wouldn't happen. You know, because, because maturity here looks like you both serve and are willing to be served. You're secure enough to do that. The relationships work best through interdependence, right? I mean, look, there is no marriage. I'm telling you, 100%. There is no marriage that ends in divorce when you do this God's way, where one person serves the other person and that person serves them. I mean, it's, this is possible. You see, broken relationships are the result of disordered and distorted love. That's why we carry the pain we carry. But God gives us another way. So listen, love rightly ordered and purely lived out in our relationships, honestly, it becomes this picture of heaven on earth. It really does. Because you're living out the ways of heaven in your marriage, in your family, in your workplace, in this church. So let me just ask you, don't, don't you want that? Like think about what's on the, the other side there. Don't you want to be on the receiving end of that kind of relationship? Doesn't that sound awesome? Well, let's start there. Let's start there. Let's be the kind of church. Let's be that kind of church. Let's, let's just do as Jesus did. Let's choose humility. Let's, let's choose humility. Let's learn to love well as he loves. And let's begin to see what happens in our relationships right? Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love for us. Man, as we think about all of of the relational pain that we carry, all of the confrontation we feel like we got to deal with, all the conflict that we get worried about, 
all the brokenness from our past, all the anxiety about the future, all of it. When we think about these things, there's a sense where it becomes overwhelming to us. And so we're thankful, Jesus, that you've given us this secret, the secret of walking in your way of humility and holding up the interests of others above our own. Help us to live this out and trust you with the result. We wanna be obedient and trust that you have everything under control and we don't have to worry about it. Help us to walk like you walk, Jesus. We love you. We pray this all in your name. Amen.